Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about fire ants and carpenter ants, and we'd like to thank Paul from the Podcast Gumbo newsletter. He recommended our podcast, and you can check it out at paulcondo.com. It's P-A-U-L-K-O-N-D-O.com, and he has podcast recommendations. So can't you just search for Podcast Gumbo? Or search for Podcast Gumbo Newsletter. And we also spoke to Stu Clark from Tarot this week, and he has some tips about ants. A Harvard University study dates ants back about 130 million years. They lived during the time of dinosaurs. Mm. And researchers think ships from South America brought the first black imported fire ants into Alabama around 1918, and then red imported fire ants in the 1930s or 1940s. So they would load ships with soil for ballast to help with stability when these ships were sailing from South America, and the soil would then be unloaded and replaced with cargo, Mm -hmm. and evidently fire ants were in that dirt. Bummer. (laughs) What are fire ants? So there's two main types, red and black, and the most common fire ant, and the biggest problem in the U.S. is the red fire ant, They have a head that's reddish in color. Their bodies can vary in color from reddish brown to black. And they have two distinctive bumps between their abdomen and thorax. They're usually only an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch long. Wow, they're tiny. Very small, but they have very strong mandibles to grip. And if you're attacked by a fire ant, it'll hold on with its mandibles. And then they attack you? (laughs) They're irritated very easy. Mm. They use the stinger to inject a toxic venom. And once it stings you, it can rotate while holding on with its mandibles and sting you multiple times. Mm. So it can leave a circular pattern of these stings. And that venom has two main chemicals. One is toxic to cells and causes pain like you're being touched with a lit match. A lit match? Wouldn't you say fire? (laughs) Isn't that where they got their name? (laughs) Right, exactly. They got called match ants. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then the other chemical is similar to black pepper. The toxins kill cells, causes itching, and then a defensive reaction in your body forms pustules about a day later. What and is it? Pustules, so pus-filled bumps. And if the skin is broken on these pustules from itching, it can cause infections and scarring. Mm. And then there's a protein in the venom that can cause an allergic reaction in some people, causing nausea and headaches. And for people that are hypersensitive to fire ant venom, it can cause anaphylactic shock. How would you know? The Mayo Clinic says some of the symptoms of anaphylaxis include hives, flushed or pale skin, swelling of the face, eyes, lips, or throat, wheezing or having trouble breathing, a weak or a rapid pulse, nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, dizziness or fainting. And they said if you see somebody with these symptoms, you should call 911 immediately or get to an emergency room. They're saying that untreated anaphylaxis can kill in about 30 minutes. Wow. Besides attacking you, are there any other problems? They can create huge mounds of dirt. So they're going to have 100,000 or more ants per colony and 1 to 80 queens, which is pretty interesting. That mound can be a foot high or taller and 2 feet wide. And the mounds don't have a central entrance on top like many ant mounds. They're going to have multiple entrances all around the mound. And these mounds cause problems for landscaping and farming equipment. Some areas in Louisiana have as many as 60 mounds per acre. And some areas in Texas have 200 or more mounds per acre. Wow, everything's bigger in Texas, huh? (laughs) Fire ants can chew on insulation and wiring damaging equipment. And the USDA found that they're drawn to electrical circuits. One study in traffic light switches found that ants that get shocked release pheromones to attract more ants. And one switch box was so filled with fire ants that it malfunctioned. Mm. The USDA estimates about $6 billion in yearly losses because of fire ants from farms, nurseries, sod producers, cropland, pasture land, animal production, hay production, golf courses, airports, cemeteries, commercial businesses, homes, and schools. 
So could and you it, have just said everything outside? Actually, I was fascinated by all the different industries that you don't even think of about. outside stuff? <laughs> so everything outside. <laughs> and in some areas, fire ants are causing a decline of small animals like quail, lizards, and frogs, either killing the babies or reducing the amount of insects that the animals need to thrive. Hmm. And fire ants will also attack honeybee colonies feeding on the pollen, bee pupa, and larvae. You know, pupa is the singular, and pupae is plural. Hmm. Great, thanks for that. One article I read said gardeners who buy bugs to control aphids and other pests in their gardens have found that fire ants are eating the eggs or larvae before they can develop. And one gardener said he always bought lacewing eggs glued to cardboard, and mm-hmm. so the lacewing develops and helps control pests in his garden so he doesn't have to use chemicals. The fire ants are eating all the eggs, so all he has left is just cardboard <laughs> out in the garden. What do they eat? They're omnivores, so they're going to eat plant or animal life. They like insects, earthworms, pet food, insect eggs, oily plant seeds, fruit, small, young, and newborn birds, animals, and reptiles, and dead animals. And fire ants will actually eat the fly larva that's feeding on dead animals to protect that food source. Mom, I guess I should have asked, what don't they eat? (laughs) And they like honeydew. And for birds that nest on the ground, when a chick first starts to break open the shell, yolk spills out, it attracts fire ants, and the movement of the chick causes the ants to attack it and kill the chick. That's terrible. Yeah. The worker ants can't ingest solid food bigger than two microns. A human hair is 75 microns. The workers are primarily feeding on sugary liquids for energy, and they're carrying the solid food back to the colony, and they're feeding the particles to the larva in the last stage of development. They can eat and digest solid food, and they're also helping feed the other ants. So the workers put a piece of this food that they find on the stomach of the larva, or they put it in a special groove that holds this food. The larva then regurgitates the contents of its stomach onto the food to turn it into a liquid. Then nurse ants feed this dissolved food to the queen, and when she's full, the other ants share in the liquid. Hmm. Workers that bring back sugar or fats in liquid form store it in their communal stomach. So do they have two? They have two stomachs, and they call the sharing of food from their communal stomach trophallaxis, and the definition of that is the mutual exchange of regurgitated liquids. Are you just trying to be gross? (laughs) Foraging ants make adjustments to the type of food collected from feedback from the colony, how much protein is needed for the queen and larva, and how much sugar and fats are needed for energy for the other ants. A Penn State University said about 12 fire ants can kill a 3-inch long fence lizard in less than a minute. Fire ants can kill small birds and animals and strip them down to the bone. And a study done with lizards in areas invaded by fire ants have found that they've evolved to have longer legs and they use a unique twitching motion so they can shake off ants. And the same type of lizard in areas not invaded by fire ants have shorter legs and no twitch. And scientists say it's pretty remarkable to see evolution in less than 100 years. It's crazy. How do you get rid of fire ants in your yard? So there's a variety of methods, but many of the experts like Stu and universities recommend a two-step method. Clemson University Extension says fire ants do most of their foraging for food when soil surface temperatures are 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And they recommend using a fire ant bait broadcast over the entire lawn when temperatures are in this range. The ants are going to take that poison bait and share it with the entire colony You're looking for a slow-acting bait to have the best chance of this bait being fed to the queens, and that's going to stop egg production. After one or two weeks, then you want to treat individual mounds with a fire ant mound treatment. Okay. And that's an insecticide. Hmm. How do the baits work? So they're either going to be liquid or solid food, and they have a poison that either affects the nervous system, the digestive system, their metabolism, or it'll actually interfere with reproduction and growth. Hmm. And the chemicals can work over a period of a few days or a few weeks or even months. The slower the poison, the more likely it will get to the queens because the queens are hard to get to. They have food testers. (laughs) They're deep underground. And a study done by the USDA found queens as deep as 10 feet, but they're usually 2 to 4 feet. The queens also create a chamber that they seal with soil and chemicals in their saliva, and they create waterproof walls. We don't have fire ants in Illinois yet, right? Right. 
but my mom's go-to move whenever she deals with ants is to pour boiling water on top of the mound. Yeah, that's actually or pretty in, popular. Or insecticide on right. the mound, but right. that wouldn't work with the fire ants, right? Well, it's hard to get to the queen. There was a study done that about 80% of people just tried to control fire ants by soaking the mound with insecticides. And mound treatments alone aren't effective at getting all the queens, so the colony just rebuilds. And in many areas, they're concerned with overuse of chemicals and contamination of groundwater, lakes, and streams. So by baiting, the ants find this poison food. They leave a pheromone trail so other ants can find the same spot, and they're bringing more of this bait back to the colony. And once a large group is poisoned, then the mound treatment can reduce the colony, they're saying, by 80 to 90 percent. Mm. And then if you rebait your area, it helps control the ants in your, like, especially if it's around your house. Right. When you're using bait, read the application recommendations and storage. You want to keep the bait fresh. Once you open the package, many start to degrade. Soybean oil-based baits can get rancid if they're not used or stored properly, and then it won't attract ants. And many baits can be contaminated with cigarette smoke or vapors from chemicals like gas or insecticides. Mm. And a lot of these say they once you put it down, you don't want to have rain in the forecast for 24 to 48 hours. Okay. There are a couple certified organic products for fire ant control. D-limonene, it's D dash L-I-M-O-N-E-N-E. This is the chemical that's found in the peels of citrus fruit. And spinzosad, so it's S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. It's a natural substance made by soil bacteria and it's toxic to insects and very low toxicity to people and pets. Mm. Some home remedies that don't work, putting (laughs) instant grits on the ground and hoping that when the ants eat it, it kills them baking soda or plaster of Paris, or trying to feed fire ants club soda or molasses. (laughs) Scientists are researching some natural enemies of the fire ants that are in South America. The University of Texas is studying forid flies. They're called decapitating flies. So the female forid fly injects an egg into the thorax of a fire ant. And as the larva develops, it feeds on the ant while it's still alive. It works its way to the head, Mm -hmm. and then it releases an enzyme that dissolves the tissue between the head and the thorax, so the head falls off and the fly can leave the ant's body. And because you were so excited about this, you had to show me a video. (laughs) It was gross. Where are fire ants in the U.S.? So they're mainly in the southern states, warm climate, and California. And some of the top-rated fire ant killers are from Ortho, O-R-T-H-O, Taro, T-E-R-R-O, Amdro, A-M-D-R-O, Advian, A-D-V-I-O-N, Bear Advanced, Extinguish Plus, and Plus is spelled out, P-L-U-S, Martin Surrender, it's M-A-R-T-I-N apostrophe S, Surrender, Max Force, a couple of top-rated mound treatments are from Conquer Insecticide and Bifen IT. It's B-I-F-E-N and then the letters I and T. Carpenter ants were first named in 1773 and were the first ants in the U.S. to be named. They're black, reddish, or red and black in color and large from a quarter inch to a half an inch long. And they don't create mounds in soil like fire ants. They try to find wet or soft wood to hollow out for their colony. Mm. And they don't eat wood like termites. They just burrow into it and then remove the wood to create their tunnels and chambers. And they don't sting like fire ants, but as a defense, they'll bite with their mandibles and then they'll spray formic acid into the wound from their abdomen to cause pain. That's not nice. and, And formic acid got its name from formica, the Latin name for ant. Where are they located? They're found throughout the U.S. and can be a nuisance in homes if they find soft or rotted window or door sills because they can set up a colony behind your walls. And some colonies get large enough that you can hear them moving behind your walls. That's disturbing. (laughs) What do they eat? Carpenter ants primarily eat dead insects, plant juices, and honeydew, and their diet varies throughout the year from proteins to sugars. When carpenter ants find dead insects, they suck out the body fluids and bring it back to the colony for protein. And the University of Ohio believes that carpenter ants collect protein for the larva like fire ants, Mm -hmm. and then plant juices, honeydew, and other sugary liquids for energy. And carpenter ants will actually farm aphids 
What are aphids? They're little insects that feed on the sap of plants, and they're secreting the sticky, sugary substance called honeydew. And some ants will stroke the aphids with their antenna, and that stimulates them to release honeydew. <laughs> and ants will protect them from other insects that like to eat them, like ladybugs. So the carpenter ants, they feed off the honeydew for energy, and then they bring back honeydew to the colony for other ants. And entomologists have found that the chemicals on ants' feet they think make the aphids submissive and stop the growth of the aphids' wings so they can't fly away. And some ants they've seen bite off the aphids' wings to keep them in place so they can get the honeydew. <laughs> and then so the aphids can survive during the winter. Some ants will take the aphid eggs and store them in the colony till spring, and then when they hatch, they bring them back out the next year so they can put them on plants and farm them for honeydew. Wow. Amazing what goes on. <laughs> what do they do during winter? Scientists say they go into a state called diapause. They don't call it hibernation. Because ants are cold-blooded, if the temperature gets too high or too low, they die. If ants are in your home, they're protected from freezing. But if they're outside in an underground rotted tree stump or root system, they're going to seal up the colony and wait for it to warm up. Mm. When they go into this diapause, they can go for months without eating. So it's kind of like hibernation. Exactly. But it's diapause. <laughs> How do you get rid of them? So the best way is with bait, especially if they're in your house and they've left that pheromone trail where other ants are going to follow this. Because if you're just using an insecticide and spraying the ants you see in your house, if the workers don't come back to the colony, scientists say that the queen will actually increase her egg production mm -hmm. because of the lost ants. So with bait, they're taking this bait, the whole colony is going to be killed along with the queen. Interesting about carpenter ants is they usually only have one queen. Mm. And by using sugar-based and protein-based traps or baits, you're going to get your best results because their diet varies throughout the year. How do you know and what type of bait it is? In general, the liquids are sugar-based and the non-liquid are protein-based, but I would look on the label for something that says for the ants protein and grease cycle. Mm -hmm. And you want to put these bait stations down where you see ants. They'll take this new source of food and leave a trail for other ants to follow. And you actually may see more ants for a few days, but once they feed the colony and the queen, you're not going to have problems from that colony anymore. And then if you don't have ants in your home yet and you want to prevent it, you can use a border control around your house on the outside. Some of the top rated carpenter ant killers. Is it going to say just carpenter ants on it? Some of them will. And then if you look at the label, they're generally going to list the type of ants. But some of them could say ant killer or ant and roach killer. R right. Some of the insecticides. So some like polish border, border control. control. Right. right. Exactly. So, so I kind of answered my own question. <laughs> Taro Liquid. It's T-E-R-R-O. They have bait stations that you can use inside and out. They also have border control Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, they have liquid bait stations and border control. Max Force, it's M-A-X, Force. How They're... else are you going to spell Max? People spell stuff crazy nowadays. <laughs> so Max, M-A-X, mm -hmm. their Carpenter Ant Bait Chill, it's a protein and grease based. You have Combat, Advance, A-D-V-A-N-C-E, Advion, A-D-V-I-O-N, and that's a protein and grease based and Taurus SC. It's T-A-U-R-U-S and the letters S-C. And that's an insecticide. We talked to Stuart Clark from Taro. Hey, JC. Hi, Stu. Hey, Cindy and I were talking about fire ants and carpenter ants, and we were hoping you could share some tips. Sure. Always good to talk about ants, I'll tell you. <laughs> my, my favorite subject. You know, fire ants, we were down in Florida just a little while ago, and the thing about fire ants is most people really start getting upset about fire ants when it starts to get hot and the mounds first pop up. Right. But really, the time to go after fire ants is right now in that August and early fall. Because if you don't want to have a lot of fire ants in the springtime, you can start baiting right now. And so that is the best time to put down these broadcast baits that you can buy. And they're clearly labeled at the, at the hardware store. And you basically spread them over the entire lawn. It's a very, very slow-acting, active ingredient. Okay. And the ants will literally pick up these little corn granules that have the active ingredient and oil and carry it back to the mound. 
and really sort of decimate the population in the fall so that you're killing off as many queens as possible. And then when they begin to get active, then in the springtime, there's a lot less ants. You know, I really think that's step one on fire ants. You know, remember, when you're doing fire ants, you're talking the whole yard. And these things, have you ever bit, been bit by one, Jason? No, luckily not. Oh, man. I mean, it's horrible. And, <laughs> you know, and like all the other ant species, they seem to all talk to each other without saying anything. You can see the mound. They're just sort of piled up, and there's no opening. There's no hole in the top of the mound. It just looks like a pile of dirt. Okay. And as soon as you touch the top of it, the worker ants start bubbling out, and they tend to crawl up your leg, and then all of a sudden they all bite at once. <laughs> And so, uh, anyway, it's horrible. And then it usually takes, you know, four or five days for this bite to, to, to cool down a little bit. You, you don't want to mess with fire ants. So, step one, in the fall, get some of these broadcast baits and broadcast them in your lawn. If you can get your neighbors to join in with you, that would be, that would be good, too. Smart. And then summertime comes, and the first ones start to pop up. That's when you can – we have a product of the Tiro brand. It's Tiro Fire and Killer. These are contact insecticides where you can dust it on the top of the mound. You know, as the ants will come out, you know, it'll kill them, and they'll also carry some of it back on their bodies and sort of tox out. But you can certainly do another application of bait in the springtime and then sort of mound treatment as that occurs. And these mound treatment products have been out for a long, long time. So that's fire ants. And, you know, I always love my favorite fire ant story is the ones, you know, when they have these floods down in New Orleans, because they have a lot of fire ants around the New Orleans and Florida area. And, of course, when it floods, what the fire ants do is they all grasp together their bodies. They place the queens on top. And they float. So you'll see them floating around during flood times. You'll see this big mass of ants just kind of floating along. Amazing. And then as soon, as soon as the water recedes, then they're ready to go and start another mound. So it's a, it's, it's a real pain in them by the way they <laughs> spread around. Amazing. One tip I heard, I was down in Texas, and they said if you see one of those fire ant rafts on water, is to yeah. spray it with a, a soapy solution and it breaks them up. Really? I don't okay. know. I, I was just told well, that. I yeah, well, you have that much time on your hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go right ahead. If you're sitting around fishing, I guess, that could be a good activity. But uh, today we are up in Wisconsin. Okay. My second favorite ant state. Of course, you know my first favorite ant state. Is? Michigan. Okay. Yeah, Michigan. It's just crawling with little sweet-eating ants with all the sand and, and the Great Lakes. And Wisconsin, too, gets these little sweet-eating ants, just like we have in Missouri and everywhere else in the world, and they'll come into the kitchen. So it's kind of, the time is sort of dying out now for this for these pavement ants and other sweet-eating ants. And sometimes you'll see on the pavements uh, little piles of dead ants, especially when they're harvesting peaches. That around that time. So, yeah, it's, it's about this time in August, and you'll see these mounds of, and it looks like dirt, but if you go up and look closely, they're all dead ants. Okay. They come, they come out and clean out, the, uh, clean out the colony. Interesting. Yeah, and they just take all the dens. They, they do sort of a, I guess it would be a fall clean out, <laughs> and, then, and then it won't be a little bit longer, then they'll have their mating, sort of mating rituals where they'll go out and, Finally, the queens will overwinter, and then and then the whole process starts again. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's just and of course in the springtime you've got to be ready with tarot liquid ant bait, some liquid sweet eating ant bait that that works so well. And you know, the first time you see ants, um, you can place those inside or outside. They're safe to use around kids and pets. I always like to put the outdoor liquid ant baits right outside my kitchen window. Okay. You know, on ne next to the foundation, and that helps a lot if I can remember to do it to stop the ants right there before they even come in the, into the house. You know, always when looking at an ant problem, think about queens because really, what you're going after, you're going after the colony, which means you've got to go after the queen. And to get the queen, she's down outside, underground, in the nest, in the colony, and in order to get to her, you've got to get the workers to work for you. And the best way to do that and keep them alive long enough is give them a, a liquid to carry. And in that liquid, put an active ingredient that won't kill them instantly. 
Interesting. So, yep, that's Ant 101. <laughs> what are some tips for carpenter ants, Stu? Okay, carpenter ants. Well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what carpenter ants are and where they are. Okay. Again, carpenter ants, the main colony is usually outside near a tree, but they love water-damaged wood. And so they're always looking for water-damaged wood. So you step outside your house, start to walk around, and ask yourself, where do I have some water-damaged wood or wood that would be moist, wood that would be close to the ground and could potentially be wet and be humid? And so you'll, you'll see down by your downspouts, if you have a deck, you'll look underneath the deck. Those are the areas where the carpenter ants like to bring the eggs after they're laid by the queen and actually carry them to locations and hatch the larvae there because they can raise them better there. And so carpenter ants, they're not eating your deck. They're living in it. So the damage they create is really harborage damage. So if you've got them, and then it's just really the same way. You can use a bait, and they'll take a liquid or a granular bait. So you always put around. If you see big black ants, it's a carpenter ant, okay? okay? If you see one, don't kill it. Follow it. And it will lead you either away from your house or toward your house. And if it leads you away from your house and, and you have the time <laughs> and patience, it'll lead you to the main colony. And if it's going toward your house, it'll lead you to where these satellite colonies are where they're raising their young. You can place either a granular bait or a liquid bait and let them take that back to the colony and also feed themselves the larvae, and that'll have a big impact. And then if they continue to be a problem, then you can really treat those areas where they're raising the young well satellite colonies and just keep going after them. You know, they're not so damaging an insect in the Midwest and some other areas. Now, in the north, in the northwest, obviously, it's a, it's a more serious problem. And if you have carpenter ants that you can't control when you're in the northwest, you might want to call in the pest control operator to help you out. Okay. So, Stu, if we want to learn more about the Tarot products, where would we go? Okay, JC, yeah, just go to tarot.com. And all the products are listed there. There's also videos there that show how to use the products. And... Uh, show you some of the newer products we have, which also, uh, you know, we've got a new ant bait we're pretty excited about that actually contains some uh, protein-based bait to go along with it. So it covers protein-eating ants and sweet-eating ants. It'll also give you sort of a free roach bait at the same time. So, yeah, just go to tarot.com. Excellent. Thank you, Stu. I appreciate your time. Okay, Jesse. Nice to talk to you. Ant Training 101. <laughs> I never knew that carpenter ants had satellite colonies to raise the young. Mm-hmm. That's int- I, I always learn something new when I talk to Stu. That's good. Do you have anything else to add? For fire ants, use a two-step method. Bait your lawn first and then wait a couple of weeks and then individually treat the mounds. For carpenter ants, use liquid sugar-based and protein-based bait and you're going to get the best results. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Player FM, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon, book one through five. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com, and you can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Deep, 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 deep,